So this is like the first tutorial. I'll give some supplementary examples and some exercises. Okay, so, so here's the example. So VW vector space over F. So we have to find the set V plus W with a circle. And it's defined as the order pair of all V and W. And then why while like this just looks like the Cartesian product, but it is not just the Cartesian product because we define addition and scalar multiplication on those sets. Okay, so the addition is just coordinate wise addition, and the multiplication you just bring the scalar into each coordinate. Okay, so this is called the extended direct sum, and we'll come back to this notion later. Here's more exercise. Uh, no, here's more examples. So f is a field v y. This is y. Okay, just uh, bad handwriting. Uh, y. Y is a vector space over f. V w is a subspace of y. Okay, so we're given vector space, and we have two subspaces of it such that their intersection is just a zero vector. And because if you're a subspace, you must contain a zero element. And what they have in common is just only the zero element. Okay? And second condition is that y is equal to v plus w. So v plus w is defined to be set of all v plus w or v is from v, w is from w. So if you have y is equal to this set, then we say y is internal direct sum of y plus w. While the word internal refers to like the first condition right because you're given a space and you have two subspace and inside the two subspace it add up to give the big space so it's an internal direct sum of y plus w and here's an example no here's an exercise the exercise is that we want to show that there exists a mapping from t uh, sorry there exists a mapping t that maps from this y to the external direct sum, okay, such that for any k in the field and for any y1, y2, and y, we have t, we have this equality. So if you know what is a linear function, this is basically says that there exists a linear mapping between 1 and y plus w, okay? So it really just say that oh we're given y and you have these two conditions then there exists a linear mapping between y and the external direct sum of v and w so here now so we want to prove it right and the proof is given here okay so first of course because y is equal to v plus w then we know that y is a subset of v plus w which means that so for any y there is a vw such that y is equal to v plus w right and if we can write y as v prime plus w prime what we really want to say is that the expression is unique using the fact using this property so so let me give a give, let me give my argument now so y is v plus w, if y can be expressed as another way, then we know that we have this. And do some simple algebra, we have this. Well, this means that w minus w and v prime minus v, they are in v and in w, right? Well, v intersecting with w gives you only the zero vector, which means that v minus negative v is zero, which means that v and negative v v prime and v w and w prime they are the same right which means that for any y there exists a unique pair of vectors from v and w so the expression is unique well we wanted to find a function right then we could just define ty to be the vy and wy such that vy plus w is the y right because for each y we have a unique unique combination and which means that the function is kind of well defined right because given each input you have only one output 
right? For each input, you have only one output, and this output is the unique pair such that they add up to y. Okay, then now we have t of k11 plus y2 is equal to, by simple algebra, it's going to be like this, right? Well, it's going to be like this. It's a simple algebra because ky1 is equal to kb prime plus kw prime. y2 is v plus w. Then ky1 plus 1, 2 is equal to kv prime plus v plus kw prime plus w. So these two coordinates, right, goes to each of their corresponding position, right? Ky1 plus yw exactly like this and we using our our operation to find an external direct sum we can express this like this so these two are equal to each other for any y1 y2 and any k in the field okay so the proof is completed okay all right now here's a note when t, when this function happens to be bijective, it is called a linear isomorphism between y and this set. Okay, it's called a linear isomorphism. And we will study linear isomorphism more and more. Okay. Now, okay, let's just, okay, so here's an exercise. The exercise is kind of long. So, this exercise is a bit long, but it's fine. So we let, I'll just call this, I don't know, this is, a, this is a set, right? So we have a inverted triangle. We have this non-empty set. And for any lambda, right, V lambda is a vector space. So which means that this is the index set. For each lambda, we have, we have assigned a vector space. And we define V to be the union of all lambda in this set, in the index set. <laughs> Then we define this product. This is just a notation. And what is this? It's defined to be all function from the index set to V. Okay? So this is the set of all function from the index set to V, where V is the union. Okay? Such that for any lambda in the index set, so for any input, f lambda is in the corresponding v lambda, because for each lambda we have a v lambda, right? Then which means that for any lambda in the index set, we're given lambda, we we apply f to it, and the output should be in v lambda. And this is called a direct product of v lambda. Okay, so we denote f by this. So this is like basically the output, okay? We denote the function by this. So where each x lambda is e defined to be each f lambda. So this is like the output, right? This is the output, the, the set of all the output for a lambda in the index set. When lambda is clear, we just write this abbreviation. When we know what is lambda, no, sorry. When the index set is clear, when the index set is understood, we just we just ignore this part. We just use this abbreviation. Okay? All right. So, for each two function in the set, right, in the set, and kappa in the field, we define their addition to be this, and scalar multiplication to be this. We just bring a scalar inside. Okay? So, here is what we defined. And our claim is that this set with this addition and this scalar multiplication is a vector space over F, over the field, over the same field as a V. Yeah. For Kappa and F. Okay? All right. So this is the proof. It's a vector space. Well, when we prove it, we just verify all the axioms okay so for the first axiom it should be closed under addition let's see so for each function we have each x lambda is equal to some f lambda 
and this is v lambda and a subset of v and each y lambda is again a function for each lambda can be expressed as a g lambda and g lambda is in v lambda okay okay v lambda and v now each x lambda plus y lambda is in v lambda because each v lambda is a vector space right this is our assumption now which means that this function is really just f plus g and each f plus g lambda is in v lambda for any lambda in the index set we know this right because v lambda is a vector space f lambda g lambda is in the corresponding lambda and f plus g lambda is again because v lambda is a vector space it is closed under addition vector addition right so we have this which means that this is in the set so it is closed under addition and commutative and you can just verify the axioms by yourself because each v lambda is a vector space and again for the additive additive identity we and we consider this so where each zero lambda is the zero and v lambda for all lambda so zero lambda is the zero vector in each v lambda for all lambda so we have this so f so the function such that f lambda equals to zero lambda for all lambda we have this function right we can define this function now for any g g is equal to some y lambda lambda then with f plus g is basically this well because zero plus y lambda is just equal to y lambda then is equal to g so f plus g is g so we have the additive additive identity right the zero vector now given f we define its additive inverse to be all negative x lambda because each v lambda is a vector space and the rest axioms the scalar stuff we just we just use the fact that we know it's a vector space and we're done so we just verify all these axioms so we can show we've shown that this with this addition this multiplication is a vector space over the field now note that all sequence of reals is just this okay let us let me just copy this so we claim that this is the set of all sequences all the real sequences okay let me just put it here so you can see it here's the definition pi so n for the reals okay so it's that it's a set of all function from what from natural number to v well, okay, for each n between natural number and the natural number, we have r of, we have v lambda is, is equal to r. We just let r be, e. so each of them is just r for each lambda in this, okay? v lambda is just r. Then v is again, is again equal to r, right? So this is just r. The, no matter what, the infinite union of R is just still R itself. This can be proven by induction, if you want to prove it rigorously. It's really easy, so I skip it. And F, right? So for this, it's all function from natural number to real numbers. Where each F lambda is in real numbers. For each lambda and n right so it's all function it's a set of all function from from natural number to real number such that fn is in real for any n and this this is basically the meaning of set of all sequences right okay let's just move on again when the cardinality of the index set is finite. Say we just create a bijection to say we have lambda is this set. Then V lambda is just x1 to xn where each xj is in vj. Okay? So it's just like the n tuple. 
intuple instead of all intuple where each coordinate is in one of the corresponding vector space so if all of them are the same if all the vj's are the same then this is basically the cartesian product right this is basically the cartesian product of v1 with itself n times well when the cardinality becomes infinite no matter what is countable or uncountable the notion of direct sum we define it like this so the direct sum of all lambda and index set v lambda is defined to be the all functions again the, so all functions right such that f is equal to zero for all but finitely many so it's finitely supported we have it is equal to zero for infinite infinitely many elements and it does not equal to zero for only finitely many lambda in the index set okay so if you know topology right this is really similar to the product topology definition and right so this seems more like the box topology and this seems more like the product topology right when the index set becomes infinite even countable or uncountable right now when it's finite the direct sum is just the direct product well, this can be easily shown, so I just skip it. And when it's infinite, the direct sum. So this is a subspace of the direct product space. I.e., we have this. We have this. It's less than or equal to. It's a vec vec. It's a subspace of this space. This is our meaning, right? This is my meaning here. This is the meaning. It's a vec it's a subspace, and here is the proof. This is our exercise, okay? And okay, so for x lambda and y lambda and the set, we know that, right? Each f lambda can be expressed like this, and kappa can be expressed like this. Then, right? Kappa x lambda can be expressed like kappa times f lambda. As x lambda and y lambda is equal to each of the zero v lambda for all but finitely many of them, right? If it's finitely supported, their sum and their scalar product is still finitely supported, right? So f plus g and kappa f is again in this set. So it is closed under, you know, closed under addition and scalar multiplication, then it's a subspace. Okay, and the proof is done. It's very short. All right, so exercise again. So for T is a linear space, the kernel in the range to be, so the kernel is all V from the given vector space V such that it maps to the zero vector and W. And the range is just, just the, all the out, possible output is all the range of the function. Okay, the domain and range. Recall from high school. Then, kernel of t is a subset of v and the range of t is a subset of w and here's a proof so we first prove the kernel is a subset of v before we sh prove that we will first we want to show that t brings the zero vector to the zero vector so t maps the zero vector in v to the zero vector in w this is what we want to show first okay so to show this because zero t of zero plus v1 is t zero v plus t v1 and it's equal to tv1, right? Because 0 plus v1 is v1, right? tv1, okay? Which means that if we apply the additive inverse on both sides, we can cancel out, right? So we cancel out this, we have the cancellation law, then t0v is the 0 w. With this being said, we have kernel t is non-empty. So we have elements that maps to the 0 vector in w. Damn, so smart. Okay, to meet the requirement, right? Okay, and for any kappa and x, y, we want to show that it's closed under this, right? So we want to show that, okay? So t 
of kappa x plus y is kappa tx plus ty because t is linear and is equal to zero because they are zero, they are zero. Then which means that they're in the kernel of t. Okay, then we're done. Okay, secondly, we want to show that range of t is a subspace of w. Zero of w is in the range of t, so it's non-empty, right? Because we have this, so the range is non-empty. Now for a, b, and range, we let tx a and ty is equal to b, okay? So that t maps x to a and t maps y to b because a, b are in the range. Then t of kx plus y, we use a linear and zero kappa a plus p, and is in the range because we have this is equal to kappa a plus b. So kappa a plus b is still in the range because we have kx plus y. Okay, then, all right, this concludes the tutorial. I'll just give some kind of important examples and there are still many examples in my prof's lecture notes, but I just skip it, okay? All right, see you guys.